I am very excited to welcome back Eric Wetterling to the show. He embodies everything this channel is about, which is be a contrarian, find high upside assets that no one else wants, and wait for the market to finally realize your bullish thesis, which it seems the market and the stars are aligning in the case of inflation and hard assets. So welcome back, Eric. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So could you just give some insight into your philosophy and the psychology and the pain tolerance that you need to be a successful investor? Yeah, I mean, first of all, everybody should have their own strategy. It's like, I know what works for me, what I like. I never really liked being a trader. I was not good at it. I, I didn't like the feeling of buying something where you have no idea what it's actually worth and just hoping that somebody pays up. Uh, that's too artificial for me. Uh, simply wasn't in my nature, I think. Uh, I'm mostly focused on gold and silver. I mean, that's the realest of the real assets, pretty much. So, I mean, what is value? I mean, what is money, etc.? So it's like, yes, my, my portfolio, my overall portfolio has been quite stagnant over the last year or so. I'm not worried about that at all because I think the average return of any of my holdings, I mean, not every holding will do well. I think the average return when we reach the next inevitable sentiment high will be some two, 300% quite easily. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, my philosophy is basically look at the companies, focus on the companies. That's the only thing you can really control. And there's a huge difference. Some companies are down 70% that should be down 80%. Some companies are down 70%, that should be up 50%. So there's a, uh, you know, uh, every stock is a different hand. I mean, you played poker. So it's like we have thousands of hands in front of us and we can play each one or none at any given point in time. And the, the quality of the hands will differ and they change every day because the prices of all securities pretty much changes. So I just try to buy the best value companies or the best mining companies with the, with, typically probable growth, uh, preferably margin of safety, you have some beta and you have some alpha. Right now, it's just buying the best juniors I can find that are not overvalued and almost no junior is overvalued. And then you just let the case play out. I mean, I think a lot of these juniors have, you know, they could have tripled their value in the next two years. So, I mean, that's going to blow away. Who cares if silver is at I don't know, 25 or 18 in two years. If they triple the value, you're going to get bailed out pretty much anyway. And still, I think a lot of people just focus on, you know, silver's up today. I want to buy some silver juniors. And the next day they're down. So they sell. And it's like, the, yeah, basically playing a casino with no, re no real plan, just momentum trading really. Exactly. But that's why I love having a disciplined poker player on because the market is absolutely a casino and the house always wins because it bets that humans are going to use the flaw in their psychology to just chase the next hot thing. It works every single time because that's just what humans do, but they don't have that disciplined pro poker player who goes and sits down and doesn't play his pair of jacks. At the end of the day, you know, it's not the right thing to do. So you just do, you discipline, you grind until you get that perfect life-changing hand which is what you're talking about, waiting for the market to realize, to come around to the bull case on, on miners, like it always does eventually, and bring you that life-changing moment, having the discipline to wait through the pain, right? I mean, just to uh, make some points on that, what you say about poker, which I think is probably my main asset, actually having that poker background, because yeah. I mean, that was all about uh, being rational 100% of the time or close to it, all about the odds, all about uh, reading your opponents, uh, all about knowing what the, you know, the typical opponent does wrong. I mean, so, so I think that's a great approach. When you look out there, uh, you can see what people tend to do. And then it's your job. I mean, as a, if you're a poker player or an investor, you should like reverse engineer that to like, how do I take advantage of it? I mean, that, what, what does people typically do? People want to get rich tomorrow. Okay, what does that lead people to do? They buy the pre-discovery place, uh, bet everything on real hype uh, or, you know, a coming as a result. So, okay, that's obviously something that attracts a lot of people. Instant gratification or the allure of instant gratification 
uh, getting rich tomorrow. Okay, how do you play that? Obviously, by playing that real hype, you can buy an exciting story and sell it. Let's say, especially at least if the sentiment is okay before assay results. So you get that speculative real hype revaluation, but you let's say you sell before the assay results, so you take no assay risk. And what's another thing people don't want to do? They don't want to wait. Okay, how do you take adventure, oh, advantage of that? Be more patient. I mean, I found myself uh, uh, going into a private placement in a company, and there's one project that you're probably not going to work on this year. So I'm like, uh, okay, you know, in, instantly, spontaneously, like, I don't know if I'm going to bother with this. And then I just caught myself, like, a year is not that long, even though it feels like that. And obviously, when when the long term gets becomes short term, you're going to get the revaluation. And typically, that's, that's a very risk, uh, low risk thing. Buying future exciting uh, news releases uh, early on when nobody thinks it's exciting yet. But as that long term becomes short term, uh, you'll probably get the excitement. So, I mean, th there's thousands of things we do as humans, which we uh, tend to want to do and if you just think about it you can just again like reverse engineer okay if i feel like doing this and everybody else feels like doing this how do i actually take advantage of what everybody feels like doing and that's that's e easier said than done because it's freaking hard to wait exactly exactly but uh you know as you know that the house always wins and the house is going to clear the board of everyone else's money once they're all crowded into one trade just like Look at the great fang trade unfolding now. How many people, you know, probably billions of people investing in the big tech names for the last 20 years now just getting absolutely wiped out. And that's just how it works, right? And, and okay, on that point, uh, sorry for just interrupting. All no, yeah. time, but but that, that's a great case, I think. It's like I never, I haven't been invested in the broader market, especially not tech in quite some time. So again, if you see Tesla or whatever tech stocks, if if you buy those, depending on strategy, if you're an investor, value investor of some kind, if you buy that and you're up 50%, let's say PE 50 becomes P75, and you're thinking that, hey, you know, I did a good decision here. Why? Because my portfolio is up 50%. Now, I would say you made a bad decision and you're lucky this time that it actually has worked out so far and now it's not working out, obviously. And that's what I also try to tell people. There's a big difference between something that is way above its intrinsic value, long-term intrinsic value, let's say, that should go down 50% and not go back up. Versus in, let's say, the junior space, et cetera, with gold at 1850, uh, record cash flow in the, in the industry, something that goes down 50% that shouldn't have gone down 50%. That's total opposite uh, of, of something going down 50% and should, which should not go back up because that's risk. You, you just bought something that was overvalued and you should lose on it. But if you buy something cheap and it still falls 50%, that's not really risk at face value. That's, that's volatility because that's going to come back because gravity in that case is to the upside and not to the downside. But a lot of people, again, think that, you know, a, a loss is a loss and, and you can't have paper losses or whatever. I mean, I've been down 50% in my entire portfolio many times. The thing is, I don't sell the lows. I buy the lows. And when, when the low is in, I am typically up 300% or so to the next uh, sentiment, higher 500% from the 2015-16 bottom. But the trick is obviously that you should not be selling low, you should be buying low. And the longer a correction goes on, by definition, we're one day closer, each day we're one day closer to the next sentiment high. So selling becomes worse, holding becomes better than selling, and buying becomes the best, even though everybody has the uh, opposite priority. It's like, yeah, it hasn't gone up for two years now. So so now I'm throwing in the towel. And then it's like, you know, next month it starts to go up and everybody misses that. Exactly. So we know the majority of people don't make money investing, which is why if you do the opposite of what the majority does, you probably will make money investing. Mm -hmm. And so they don't. And so I guess what, what's your take on technical analysis? Because a lot of times people look 
you know, they're, they're, they only want to buy something if it's higher than its moving average. Whereas if you just look at the charts of everything that's ever gone up exponentially, it's off of somewhere below the moving average, right? So what is your take on technical analysis? That's a good question. I mean, I, I do dabble with technical analysis. I look at some charts. It's a, mostly it's actually just to have something to do, I guess. You, you know, it's funny at least to like see what, okay, what could happen because, uh, but at the same time, I think of it uh, like this. I mean, if you're a trader, let's say, strict trader, and you see, uh, you, you think a junior has great future potential, they've just made a discovery. You think that, hey, I mean, the next 20 news releases should have more of whatever they just hit in their discovery hole. So you think there's a high probability that the company will provide probable growth and the value will go up. So if you if you look at a short and there's like a, you appear to be in the right shoulder of a reverse head and shoulders pattern, for example. And let's say it comes off a bit, uh, the, the shoulder is quite deep because, you know, silver and sentiment is bad and silver and gold has uh, gone down last week or so. I mean, traders will only, of course, go in when it actually breaks that neckline to the upside. But if you're a value investor and you're, you're trying to guess, okay, what are the next 20 news, news releases going to, you know, uh, balance of probabilities? Are they going to be net positive or net negative? And then uh, all, uh, obviously relate that to the current value. Because, I mean, if you drill some bonanza holes and it's valued at $10 million, uh, chances are it's going to go up. But uh, what I like about that is, okay, yes, you have that kind of, let's say, bottoming pattern. And a strict trader would only buy it when it's up 80% and breaks the neckline. But if you're thinking like a value investor and you see that and you're like, okay, this is definitely going to create value the pressure is going to be to the upside which means that if i'm right and let's say you think you have a 60 percent chance of being right that's going to go up to the neckline and break it so maybe a trader with low conviction and doesn't really have uh you know it's just a trade to him so it may, he might put in a one percent position uh, when when the neckline is broken, because to him it's just a paper trade, it's just a stock ticker that simply has a you know reverse head and shoulders. But if, if you're a fundamental investor, a value investor, and you see that, you obviously you might think that okay, this is so cheap relative to what they probably will have in in within the next six to twelve months. So I'm pretty sure they'll create value, and that means that neckline is actually gonna break. So I won't get in after 80% higher. I like this case so much that I will get in right now with a 5 to 10% position because I'm very sure it's going to go up to the neckline and then, of course, break it. I mean, if, if you come, uh, same pattern, let's say. One is not completed, but for the trader, it is completed. But he gets in late, quote, late when the actual pattern breaks. But he has low conviction because it's just a trade. So he has 1% position. You might be in from the bottom with a 5, 10% position. And when that neckline breaks, he's going to make, let's say, he makes the trader 60% on 1%. And, and maybe it's like 80% on your 5 to 10% position. And then that's additional 60% because the neckline actually breaks. So, I mean, same stock, uh, different strategies, and completely different returns. And that's what I also like is like position sizing because you see people brag about a trade going right all the time. I mean, that, that kind of tells you they're probably not that good because everybody can highlight at least one stock that's going up. But it's like, okay, would you rather be able to brag about one trade or would you rather have the maximum, let's say, long-term results you could? I mean, you should always be focusing on your entire portfolio and long-term results. I mean, you have to, I'm going off tangent here perhaps, but I, I think, I mean, you, you sh I see people being ashamed of having losers, you know, losers on paper even. So, I mean, if everybody's scared of making a mistake, how's that gonna help you? Are you gonna get paid if you, you know, your rep reputation is good? You only get into the, you know, sure things, et cetera. It's like there, there's so much stuff in terms of ego that gets into people's ways. I mean, believe me, it's like 
if I if I like a stock and that's down, you know, you can you can bet your ass I, I get trolled for it. It's like who cares? I mean, anyone who's out there trolling people, whatever. I I, I don't think uh, they're doing too well because we know you know misery loves company. So typically, the most bitter people and trolls, etc., they're actually the ones who are hurting and then trying to take down other people. But I guess uh, one again, one thing is that. You really should leave the ego out of it. And, you know, don't be ashamed if you're sitting at a loss at any given point in time, because that just comes with the territory. I mean, uh, I'm, I, let's say 80% of what I own, 80% of my stocks are probably down on average 30% or so from, you know, the one year high. I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of. That's how markets work. Exactly. And let's, so let's say you're sitting at a poker table and you just get like 20 bad hands given to you. Right. And you, you look like a loser because you're just sitting there bleeding chips, but you're actually being really smart. You could get all, go on tilt and get all excited about, you know, Oh, I got a, a pocket pair of threes and just try to like make a name for yourself, make an ego, do some betting. Maybe you'll get lucky, mm-hmm. but you're right. It's all about swallowing the ego and dealing with that pain and being disciplined. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. People want validation. A lot of people want validation. They want to be able to brag, even though they're anonymous people on a forum or Twitter or whatever. They want to look good uh, and and have other people believe they look good because they're not confident in themselves. They need that external validation. And typically also they, they are the ones who try to, let's say, tear people down. I mean, I hate schadenfreude pretty much. I, I don't even comment on companies I don't really know because I know I'm biased. If I don't own it, I'm biased against the company. If I own it, I'm biased for the company, obviously. But typically, you at least know something about the company you're biased for because you own it. But there, there's always going to be a lot of noise uh, again and a lot of people who don't dare to go out on a limb they don't dare to go against consensus or whatever because they, they, they fear that they will look, I mean, stupid, etc. It's like right now, people are probably shamed of, you know, or, or if they get asked, are you in gold juniors or silver juniors? You know, maybe ashamed to even admit that, yes, because the sector has been really poor for the last year. But if, you're actually, if you actually know what you're doing and can swallow that pride, you know that, I mean, the best periods comes after the worst periods. I mean, that, that's just the nature of it. Sentiment goes from high to low to high to low. We're obviously at a low right now. So it's like, yes, if you could have had, you know, perfect hindsight, sure, you would have gotten out at the, at the last talk. But, but there's no, you know, you can't control everything. The only thing we can do is play the hand we're being dealt every day as best we can. So like now, for example... I, I have thrown away the sell button uh, eight months ago. I mean, this is, a, in my opinion, perma buy environment. I, I have a buy list that's never been longer than it is now. I have no problem in finding uh, really good buys. Meanwhile, most people try to figure out whether even in the sector. Total opposite mentality. It's like, yes, I, I think I'm happy to be diversified for the very diversified for the first time in a long time because I've never seen an entire sector or subsector this cheap at the same time with gold at 1850. 2015-16 bottom, yes, juniors were absolutely cheap, but the sector was absolutely crap. Companies were near bankruptcy. Not right now, we're nowhere near bankruptcy and still they're valued like the sector is shit. Uh, shit. Yeah, there's a lot of discipline now in the market because the sector has been hammered for so long, but I just love looking at the long-term chart of gold and seeing how it went from like, it hit like 300 or $200 right before the tech bubble collapsed. And then it 10 X up to 2000 at the absolute last time that anyone would have expected. And look at oil, like two years ago, it would have been the dumbest trade ever. Or people would have thought you're so stupid for investing in energy because it's like, mm-hmm. oh, we're all going to renewables. It's, you know, fossil fuels are going away. But here, you, everyone's a genius for investing in energy, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, it was down to what? $12. You could buy, I, I actually saw an old tweet of mine from 2020. You could at one point buy a barrel of oil for a silver coin. You obviously can't do that now, but it's like, <laughs> 
again, things go up and things go down. And when we saw the lows of oil, what did the analysts say? I mean, there were a bunch of people out there saying oil is not going to trade over 30 or 40 dollars per barrel in my lifetime because the EV revolution is here. I mean, OK, obviously, they're looking super wrong right now. And, you know, to be fair, like in poker, you can't just judge a decision based on the outcome because you can obviously be all in against aces with two seven off suit. And if you win, that doesn't make, make it a good decision. You're just lucky. And it was actually a bad right. decision. So so, I mean, that's hard to do. But it's like, I mean, the funny thing is like every time we have a bottom or a top, everybody thinks it's going to go on forever. And I've, I've been asked by people, uh, you know, in the junior space, do you think that sentiment will ever change? And I'm like, we saw a high in 2020, not the highest sentiment high, but I mean, after the COVID flash crash bottom, I mean, GDXJ went up 200%, I think, in the next five to eight months. So, I mean, uh, you can't really complain about that kind of rally. So there's like nothing in history pointing that sentiment will not change. So if you just know that for a fact, and you know this is low sentiment, and you can see the prices are stupid cheap, I, I don't understand the problem. Exactly. I, I mean, that's yeah, doesn't get more obvious than that. It's like, yeah. why are people so anxious? That's, that's just the nature of markets, right? They uh, The house always wins, and they're going to manipulate people's emotions all day long, and it's just going to be the cycle. But but yeah, like Warren Buffett buys when it, the charts look at the absolute worst. That's when he's deploying capital. Yeah. So no, but you have a very interesting strategy because not only are you a contrarian, not only are you buying industries that are unloved, undervalued, you know, and cheap, but within that industry, you're finding the stuff that is like so cheap because you're spending time analyzing each company. So what is your strategy for finding an undervalued miner? I mean, that, that's very hard. It's like I've been asked or, or somebody commented on, on a YouTube video I did. It's like, this is impossible. This sector is impossible for someone new uh, because it's like, you obviously don't really know. I mean, I mean, after a few years in this sector and a lot of research and you've seen a lot of stuff go on. I mean, obviously, you know a lot more than you used to, but you can't really quantify how much you know. So if you're new going into this sector, that's all. I mean, how on earth are you going to know what a good junior is? I mean, o- o- the only option you really have is to, you know, buy GDXJ or something. Meanwhile, I mean, I think the juniors, not that, I mean, GDXJ, yes, it has junior in its name, but it's not really juniors. It's just, you know, producers. So, I mean, the absolutely cheapest ones right now are the juniors. But that's when you actually have to do stock picking because there's no index that buys the, you know, 10 to 20 or 30 million market cap companies. So that's obviously a very hard thing to do, like figure out what is uh, actually worth buying. And you also need the conviction because if you see a stock, I mean, anytime you see a junior down 10% on a day, people are asking, what happened? Like, like something happened. I mean, no, people just feel like selling and there's no buyers. That's, that's what happened. Uh, but, but I mean, there are some things I think that are like good rules of thumb, let's say. I mean, the less you know, obviously, people and the track record of management becomes more important because you know that someone that's serially successful, he's not going to get out of bed in the morning if he doesn't think there's a shot that whatever they're working on, it could be a success because I mean, he has a repute. Typically, I mean, successful people care about the reputation. They care their time is valuable. They could be doing other stuff, sipping margaritas on a beach. So if they're down in the trenches, that's probably a reason for why, why they're down in the trenches. So that's a big thing. Obviously skin in the game, It's like you want them to eat their own cooking because if you hear some, you know, CEO or management team like, you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread and they own 1% of a 10 million market cap company. It's like, Jesus Christ, you you know, you don't believe in this company at all. So why would you go out and, and buy that? And one thing I really do think people should stop doing, which I love to do, uh, but so big on pre-discovery place. I mean, if, if you just made a rule, you are not allowed to buy a pre-discovery grassroot play. 
that alone, I think you you could be enough for you to beat the market if you had the patience, etc., to stick it out. Because I mean, in in our minds, we think that if I'm just in, I, I need to be in before the discovery hole happens. Okay, that's that's how people think. What typically happens for a junior pre-discovery play? Let's say they have a three percent chance of actually making a discovery hole. Three percent. And what typically happens if a junior makes a discovery hole? I mean, a really good intercept. Let's say it's up 50 to 100%. So from a poker playing perspective in that case, okay, you're taking 97% chance chance of failure to get a 50 to 100% return. I mean, that's super minus EV. And I don't think I've had many stocks that actually worked out where I bought before a discovery. So it's may I don't know why we think we're gonna get the ten bagger the next day after a discovery hole. That's a just how people. In that case, it would make sense if you get a thousand percent return if if you actually make a discovery. But it's like that. I see that all the time. That if if I was a, I wish I knew that early on. That I would simply stay away from pre-discovery plays. They're extremely hard to figure out. Uh, they're extremely hard to assess, you know, the chance of success. Whereas you, right now you can buy bank success, you can buy ounces in the ground for like, you know, seventy percent discount. So you're not even paying full price for what's, for what's already known, and you know that they'll have probable growth in the future. Instead of betting everything on something that has a three percent chance of success, and you're probably going to get cut in half ninety-seven out of hundred times. Great point. Really good to know. So you don't buy pre-discovery. I guess you wait for the discovery and you wait for the fundamentals to be good and then you wait for it to get cheap and then you buy. Yeah, 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 pretty much. I mean, the, investing is really an art and I change my strategy all the time. I mean, uh, five, six years ago, I was buying uh, highly levered companies. I was buying pre-discovery plays. You know, I had a good feeling that this one is going to hit hit something because the visual sounded good. I, I don't know how many have a actual good experience with that. No, I don't think many has. And if you look at the, some of the great success stories, like Great Bear Resources, when was the actual big money made in that stock? It certainly wasn't the day after the discovery hole because you see people all the time say that you, you, they, a junior comes up with a discovery hole and then people come in and they see prices up 50 to 100%. And they say, congrats to all holders. I don't want to chase. Okay, look at Great Bear. What happened after the discovery hole? Let's say it went up 100%. It's 10 or 20 bag the, the next three years after that 100, 100% pop. So when were the actually big returns made? It was made after the discovery hole. But we, for some reason, think we need to be before the discovery hole when we're taking enormous amount of risk for a payoff that's not at all worth it in, in relation to the risk. Instead, we're just buying when it's been de-risked. And it's like Line One Metals the other day. They put out an obscene hole, one of the best holes I've ever seen, like 20 grams per ton over 76 meters. The stock opened up after the hole 14%. It added some 20 to 25 million in market cap. It's like, and, and some people said, I don't want to chase. 14% are one of the best holes I've ever seen, 20 to 25 million uh, in added value. I mean, how is that chasing? But you, that's where we have these, you know, preconceptions or we have, you know, I don't want to chase. Uh, I missed the boat, stuff like that. When you look at every single successful story, what junior in the entire space did, became a 20 bagger in a day? No, no, 20 baggers takes years. And people still think they need to be in before and they can't buy after the discovery hole. You know, I mean, that's the start of the 10 to 20 bagger journey. It's certainly not the end of it. So there's a bunch of stuff I included, uh, you know, misconceptions about how investing works let's say in this sector and i see people do that all the time and it's just again like poker playing poker you have to be cognizant of your own weaknesses i mean what are your 
mental errors you're making all the time. Okay, thinking that you missed a boat because a stock is up and, and you think you need to be in a uh, pre-discovery play in order to have you know, good returns. I mean, that, that, those things, if you look around and look at history, that's complete bullshit. And still everybody thinks like that today. So it's, it's just mind numbing how dumb we really are. <laughs> no, exactly. And it just shows how complicated it is because we've been talking this whole thing about how you need to be disciplined, not chase things. But then there is that time when you get that great hand, that four of a kind, and you have to go big, right? You have to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that's what you're talking about here. Like there is a time once the news is good enough and the, the price is discounting that news enough that even if it's green, it could still be life changing potentially, right? that is why I don't like strict rules, except, you know, what I just said about, okay, skip the pre-discovery place. I mean, that, that makes, in my opinion, perfect sense. But otherwise, you know, you have all the rules of uh, sell something that's down 50%, you know, for whatever reason. Some say, you know, cut their losses. Uh, some say don't chase. And the funniest thing of all is like the, the two things you hear all the time, depending on the result. Let your winners run, run and don't forget to take profits. So which is true? <laughs> Let it run or take profits. So, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff out there that's like contradictory, let's say. And I, that's why I don't think you should have a, a set rule book. You, you should, everything is about, about context. Everything is about price to context. So in, in one case, Yes, you might be chasing a stock. And yes, it might be overvalued. At another time, when we're at this sentiment low, for example, where success is, first of all, bank success is already at a discount. And a new success is getting typically discounted hard. So, I mean, in that case, if, you're, if it was cheap from the store, the case just got a lot better, at least a lot better than a 14% hike. Is that chasing? No, I think that, you know, expected value jumped 60% or whatever, and you, you paid up 14%. Sure, one could say that's chasing to me, that's like, yeah, I'm just stealing more than I did yesterday because the case actually got a lot better than the price jump. Uh, but if you have strict rules, like I never chase, I, I, I always sell everything after it has doubled or whatever. I mean, a lot of, a lot of cases actually are much better after it, has doubled. I mean, why? Because they actually, let's say, made a discovery or, or they made a new discovery or whatever. So it's like all those strict rules some people use, I mean, typically they don't make a lot of sense. And it's like a poker player, you always try to make the best decision at that point in time because no hand is the same. And that goes for every stock and every situation. Nothing is the same. So you can't just have, well, you know, in poker, I see a, you know an ace on the flop, so I always fold that. I mean, what if you have a aces on your hand? I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's like every situation is different. So everything comes down to context. And, and another thing is like, consider the fact that 19 out of 20 people do not beat an index over the long term. How many of those 20 people do you think have an opinion that they're happy to share with everyone else? I would say 100%. Right. So it's like one should be aware that it's like mo most of everything you read about investing, at least in forums and Twitter, unless you're sure that that person actually can beat an index, uh, chances are uh, you're you're getting exposed to advice that said person who says it believes to be true, but is actually detrimental to your investing uh, returns. So, so he's doing something, trying to justify it, probably never be in an index. And then you, you get influenced by that. And there's a lot more of them than there are, you know, the one in 20 that actually beats an index. So you're going to be bombarded all the time by bad advice. And that's, I guess, why Warren Buffett hides in Omaha. <laughs> right. Right. That's a good point. Absolutely. But no, it, your, your strategy is interesting because you're kind of creating your own index, your diversified portfolio, which is its own index, right? I mean, what, one could say that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we, we discussed this 
off mic. I mean, I, I like old medals because the supply demand pictures looks uh, good, you know, in everything basically. But, but I try to stick to my circle of competence and that's, you know, gold and uh, silver. That's the main ones, but I own some nickel, some coppers. I'm basically, you know, like Sun Tzu, put yourself in a position where you can't lose. If you if you buy if you have a diversified portfolio where everything is dirt cheap, and you actually have let's say some some base metals and some precious metals, okay, if they if they can keep pulling demand forward by printing money, lowering rates, yada yada yada, green uh, revolution, your base metals etc are going to do very well over the long term because the you know there's not enough supply obviously, and if you're in juniors you're actually buying the future supply. If shit hits the fan and things start to crater and we have an actual actual you know reset or real monetary crisis uh, obviously gold and silver is going to do quite well so it's like almost regardless of what way the co- global economy takes us if you have some some of everything and you all start off as dirt cheap in what scenario do you lose except you know if if the death star comes along and blows up the planet and it doesn't matter what you own in that case. So, so I just think it's like I'm I'm sh- more shield than ever, uh, you know, when it comes to my portfolio. I'm very diversified, uh, simply because everything is cheap. So I don't think I'm leaving much, uh, much gains on the table. I mean, sure, if 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 you have let's say thirty stocks, you expect the expected return to be three hundred percent in two years, and you know three stocks that's like you know five hundred percent in 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 two years. Sure, you can could go for maximum expected value and just have those three stocks. But I, I first of all, there's no guarantees. That those are your expected risk-adjusted returns, obviously. But if you have like you know the, all the 20, 30 stocks, your average return might be 225 percent. I mean, isn't that good enough? I mean, I don't think you should be too greedy at the same time when everything is cheap. Because the worst thing I would want is like you're very concentrated into your best stocks or three best stocks. Something happens and you end up in a gold bull or a silver bull or nickel bull with no nickel, silver or gold. So you were actually right on the, uh, like the case for the metals, but you uh, ended up wrong because you took too much risk. You were too greedy. So I actually like diversification right now. And that's also why it's, you know, I mean, my strategy is by growth, uh, long runways, companies that could grow for the next X amount of years, good management teams, so you don't really need to do anything. I mean, a lot of the time spent on Twitter nowadays, that's just me posting memes because I'm just waiting for the payday. I, I mean, it, it, it doesn't help the stock or the company by me looking at the ticker all day. The, 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 the assay results are going to come when they're going to come. I mean, you don't change anything by by constantly thinking about your portfolio, and in the meantime, you're just going to be bombarded by daily volatility and everybody thinking that uh, the market knows something. I mean, Jesus, if the market knew something, we obviously wouldn't have that tech bust. Oh, the the market didn't know, uh, or uh, it's like, yeah, the market knew that you know Tesla at 100p or whatever. It's like, yeah, that, that's actually the market knows that's a good bet. No, it's completely, you know, it's completely bullshit. I mean, if you have a crypto market that's up to three trillion or was, why can't something be so, why can't the junior sector be absurdly undervalued at the same time as something artificial is totally overvalued? I mean, that's just craziness on different scales. That's artificial stuff being overvalued and real stuff being unloved. So, I mean, when that mean reversion comes along, we're going to make a killing and most people will unfortunately lose their shirt. Yeah. That's what I love about your strategy. It's like a fortress portfolio. It is like every little component is so stripped down to the bones, undervalued. There's so little expected downside, but all gold has to do is move like 10, 15, 20% and you, you get life-changing money because that's how tightly wound your disciplined portfolio is really cool. Exactly. That, that's just that's a good yeah. point. Like, yeah. they are undervalued relative to gold right now. And if yeah. gold takes off, you can imagine that first of all, the mean reversion just to get 
get to where gold is valued right now. But if gold is higher, you could 2x that, 3x that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's absolutely awesome. So people are going to want to know where to find you, maybe get your research into what you're investing in. Where can people go to learn more? Yeah, I mean, I, I write on Twitter. Uh, my username is com uh, under slash. I don't, do you say that under slash? Underscore. Underscore, <laughs> underscore, uh, invest. So C-O-M-M underscore invest. And I have a website that's uh, thehedgelesshorseman.com. And, uh, you know, you, you, I have a YouTube channel I use now and then uh, go on about, you know, rants about value investing, etc. You can check, check that out if you want to just, you know, uh, basically go uh, or uh, search for the Hedgeless Horseman. And, and note that like in this case, uh, line one, which I talked about, that's a sponsor of mine. So oh. consider me biased. Uh, yeah. And do your own due diligence. Due diligence. So it's like be be aware. I have sponsors, etc., which I'm always very upfront of. I think my due diligence speaks for it. So it's not something I try to hide or anything. Well, that was a good sponsor, clearly, because it, it. You're right. It is up like you know a lot. Let's say in the year to date performance is 48 percent. So clearly, it's just because it's a sponsor doesn't mean. Well, it. Hopefully it's just the start. And, and in my opinion, I, I've actually been quite bored with that story last several months because they had very, uh, you know, a lot of problems with COVID because the project is in Fiji and they basically sealed off the entire island for or a year or so. Wow. So, so that, that was, in my opinion, uh, like the reason usually that that's a potential game changer. So anything can happen. And like I said earlier, I simply think that the, the, Expected value from that news release was worth a lot more than the 14% uh, it revalued after the halt. So in my opinion, this case changed a lot. I mean, personally, I added, uh, I upped my stake by 300% wow. uh, after the news. So, I mean, things change. I, I can guarantee that's going to be a success from here. It's just that I, I think the, the, the case itself just became like, 300 percent better something like that i mean I, I again i might be wrong but i'm betting my money and some of these will work out and some will not and hopefully the ones that work out will more than pay for the ones that do not work out yeah absolutely well thank you so much for your time i think that was a really valuable chat uh, hopefully people learned a lot I hope some people actually understood what I was talking about because <laughs> I do go on quite incoherent, incoherent rants sometimes. No, no, it's great. This discussion is for informational purposes only. Please consult a certified financial planner when making any decisions about investing. And do your own research before making any decisions. Investments are risky and you can lose lots of money in them.